Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing um, right now. And it will be, be available for you to watch later at your convenience. Uh, both our live show and our recordings are free and open for anyone to watch. Uh, so please do share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues. Um, I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archive shows. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So we are similar to your state library. Uh, so we provide services and programs and resources for all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries. Uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, um, anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, cool things libraries are doing, resources and services we think might be useful to them, uh, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, all sorts of things. Mm. We bring in guest speakers to talk on, uh, to speak on Encompass Live sometimes from um, all across the country. And we also uh, have the Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations for us. And that's what we have today. Uh, joining me this morning is Sally Snyder. Good morning, Sally. Good morning. And she is here at the Nebraska Library Commission. She is, she is our coordinator of children and young adult library services. And she does uh, three different sessions for us annually. Um, today is the best new teen reads of 2022. This is, um, you can think of this as a companion piece, uh, companion show to a previous one. She did the best new children's books of 2022, which she did do back in November. The archive the recording for that is on our website. And um, she also does her regular annual summer reading program titles for the next year. Um, she did in just December the summer reading program 2023 all together now. Um, but today we are talking about the teen reads. So I will hand it over to you, Sally, to uh, show us what you got here and um, show us all the titles to us. Thank you. I have a, a set amount of things I want to say before we really get started with the review. So Krista, help me to not forget anything. <laughs> I'm going to start with the Library Commission homepage because if you go over here to the search bar and search handouts, the top thing that comes up says Library Commission handouts. And this is all me. I'm Anybody can put their things here, but I'm the only one using this page. We have these big, big lists, which I think, I don't know if any other place where we host stuff really would work as well. <laughs> um, so right here, 20, it's already 2023, Encompass yeah. Live, Best New Teen Titles, and there's my book list. So if you want to quick print that off or make note to print it off later after you've made notes, um, that's where you can find it. I'm going to talk about all the books on this list. And that saves you jotting down so many things if you get it printed off right away. So people who are in the know probably already went there. It got put up yesterday afternoon, so nice. they probably already got a copy. Time, yeah. yeah. In the meantime, we're going to go to my my uh, there you go. PowerPoint. Um, and I'll mention here once you bring up the PowerPoint that you know you already saw where you can get the handout. Well, um, when we get the archive up, we'll also have a link to the slide presentation here too. So if this is something you'd like to refer back to um, with all the book covers and everything, you'll have access to this as well afterwards. Good point. The titles I talk about are ones that we receive here as review copies at the Library Commission. So a number of publishers send us review copies. Not everybody does, and. Nobody sends me everything, of course, because where would we put them all? Um, <laughs> but I and I read as many as I can. I read ones that I've heard things about, people talking about um, notices about best books and things like that. And I read ones that interest me or that I think might interest teens in your library. And that's how they get here. Now, I do occasionally buy a copy of a book that I've heard about, but the library doesn't own it, so I just buy myself a copy. Mm -hmm. um, I do, you'll see a number of 
titles here that have library ownership on them. They're from the public library here in Lincoln because I use a lot of their collection as well. These are titles that I have run across in whatever way that I think you might want to consider. You know your community and your library much better than I do. So these are ones I'm recommending as consideration, but I'm not saying buy all these books because I don't think anybody has that kind of budget. I wish you did, <laughs> but, um, but think about them and, and maybe you'll see some you already have and you can go, yay, I have that one. Yeah, um, all collection development at libraries is local. So um, you'll find some things here that would work for your um, teams and some that you'd be like, yeah, they're not into that. And that's perfectly fine. We have that topic covered already. We don't need another book. That's okay. Um, just a way for you to know, I have read all these books except one, I've only read part of it, and I'll let you know what one that is, because I've read all of these before I put them on my list. One I just finished on Monday. So I think that I'll probably, oh, I do have a, a blurb list, because as I've said before, if I didn't, I would talk for so long about the first 10 books, we'd never get to the rest of them, and then you'd all be mad at me, so. <laughs> I, uh, I will be reading and paraphrasing my blurb list throughout so we can get through all these titles in the time we have. So we might go a little long, it's happened before. Yes, yes, and we should probably give that um, that uh, warning at the beginning of this one. As, as is typical, if you go look at our previous, um, Sally's previous shows for her teen reads and her children's books, um, they do tend to run over our hour because there's just so many out there. So um, we will record the whole show. Um, if you need to leave after an hour because that's all the time you've allotted to attend, that's fine. You'll get access, you'll everyone have access to recording afterwards and you can watch the rest of it if you had to miss the, the end of it. But we'll go until um, Sally has gone through all of her titles. Thank you. So we'll get started. I'll probably think of something else I meant to say after we get going, but let's get started. Yeah. And I start with fiction for younger teens. Again, I should, this is something I didn't say. I put them in general categories. Um, younger teens can be, you know, middle school through beginning of high school, depends on your community. And so it's a general range. That doesn't mean high school students if they're interested in the topic, won't want to read this book. It's just that it's aimed at that age group. And I try to tell you the age of the character, the main character, when I can run it down. So you'll know, is it a 12 year old or is it a 17 year old talking? That makes a difference to, at least it does to me. Maybe it doesn't matter to you. That's okay. So the first one is, in honor of broken things, told in three voices, Oscar, Noah, and Riley, each have new situations to deal with. Football star Oscar has just lost his younger sister to cancer and is still reeling from it. Noah is new to middle, middle school, having been homeschooled his whole life, and his parents are now divorcing. Riley and her mom just moved from Philadelphia to this small town in Pennsylvania, her mom's hometown. The three connect in their pottery class and find support in each other. And from the front cover, it says, through art, football, failure, faith, and trust, the friends help one another to piece things back together again. This is a full color graphic novel. Rose, 17, okay, she's seven, I've already broken my rule. But every, all, everything in this book seems to me to be aimed at middle school. So just because she's well, 17. Can you read the title there? It's all covered up with stickers from- Oh, the it's story. called Batter Royale. Uh, Instead of battle, batter. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, from the public library. Okay, Rose is 17 and she's the Quagua's best waitress, but she loves to experiment in the kitchen. And when a well-known food critic visits the diner and asks for all the desserts, Rose also whips up something special. The critic, the critic enjoys it so much she invites Rose to participate in a food competition for TV called Batter Royal. Rose convinces Fred, her longtime friend and son of the diner owner, to be her partner in the competition. In London, all are ready to bake. As the competition goes on, Rose and Fred see cheating, sabotage, and tricky sudden changes to the rules. Winning will mean Rose can be, attend Fieldbury Culinary School, a top program, and Fred can help his mother revitalize the diner because a new restaurant just opened across the street. Recipes are included as chapter enders, and those interested in baking might find something fun to try. 
on a much more serious note, this is book one of a proposed trilogy set in 1860 in Ghana, Africa. It is set in fictionalized territories of that land. First, we join Kofi, who's 11, living his life in the Asante kingdom, practicing swimming so he can beat his cousin in a swimming match. And the annual wrestling match ends in sadness when Kofi's older brother accidentally kills his opponent, the nephew of the king of Lower Quante, and soon the king retaliates. Kofi knows he will soon be grabbed for his coming of age trials. So when a couple of men he doesn't know grabs him, he thinks it's for the trial, but that is not the case. After very bad treatment, Kofi and many others are placed on a large ship and they are leaving for somewhere else. No one knows where they are going. It ends on a cliffhanger as the ship burns at sea. Kofi and some other children were on the deck actually, and he escapes into the water. Now we must wait to find out what happens next. This is book two about Amari. After the events of the first book, Amari is looking forward to a full summer as a junior agent for the Bureau of Supernatural Affairs, only to have the leadership of the secret League of Magicians offered to her. She declines, but she then must compete in, the, in a competition to determine the new leader, the great game. Her opponent is Dylan Van Helsing, who she defeated in the first book just by the skin of her teeth. He has managed to escape his prison. Another issue in the book is that the Supernatural World Congress was frozen in time during one of their meetings and no one knows how to unfreeze them. That means a new acting prime minister takes over and he hates magicians. This is not going to be good. What is the first, did you, did you know what the title of the first book was? The first book is Amari and the Knight Brothers. Ah, okay. It has a blue cover. I just happen to remember. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Said in the past, Cooper Inski, 14, has taken over playing the ghoul from his mother. Their town is famous for the ghoul, and people come from all around to feel its threat. The town's reason for the ghoul is to keep people out of the nearby wild areas, as there is a horrible sucking mud that can bring someone down into the mud and keep them forever. So they don't want people camping in the woods. They have, they ha just coincidentally happen to have nice inns in the town that people can pay to stay at. But that's, you know, beside the point. One day a girl on a runaway horse who Copper rescues claims that the ghoul attacked her and her father and she only just got away. But Copper hasn't played the ghoul in several days. Could they have a real one now? A mystery, danger, and a town's good name are all up in the air. It's a little bit creepy, but not too bad, because you know I'm a chicken. So. Living in New York City, Karthik was volunteered by his father to deliver groceries from their family grocery store for the entire summer, not how he wanted to spend his summer before high school. It is hot, hard work, but one of the things he does enjoy is helping their customers with a variety of things that have nothing to do with his job or delivering food. One customer talks Karthik into agreeing to play Leonard Bernstein in her play for a college class. There will be only one performance, so Karthik is in. And maybe this will attract the girl he likes, Juhi. He can't tell his parents since the store is close to failing and they need him, but how is he gonna keep this a secret? This is a full color graphic novel. Bree and her father moved from Brooklyn, New York to Florida for his new job. Bree is starting middle school and wants math puzzles as one of her electives, but it is full. The only thing left is swim 101. Bree cannot swim, but she doesn't want to admit it. Negative talk to herself is shown as black outlined capitals and it's things such as, you're going to be so embarrassed. It must be your fault. New friends, Umberto and Clara are upbeat and supportive. She skips class, but then an older neighbor agrees to teach her in their pool in their apartment complex. Over time, she learns to float and swim, and one day the coach basically assigns everyone in class to try out for the swim team so we'll have enough people on the team. They race and Bree swims past all her negative thoughts and she wins. She joins Clara on the swim team and maybe this year they can finally win state. Starting middle school, sixth grade, best friends Isaac and Marco are ready. Marco is short, very short, and still hoping for his growth spurt. 
All his classes are AP, so he only has lunch and PE with his best friend. Isaac is athletic and he does okay in his classes. He has extra stress this year because his father had to move out until he can control his drinking. Marco, on the other hand, his father rarely shows up for anything because he has a new family now. Through a series of happenstances, Marco has decided to join Isaac for the basketball tryouts. Marco has never dribbled or shot for the hoop before, but he should be ready with a week of practice, right? That's his viewpoint. Middle school is a whole new world for them both. Humor, bullying, hard work, disappointment, and teamwork. This is a reminiscent of the Amari books in that it's about magic and, and a magic school. This is book one. Marvelers have finally admitted, well, not all of them, that conjurers should have been included in setting up their society and the training institute from the beginning. Now, Edla is the first conjurer to attend the Arcanum Training Institute and she is facing bullying and prejudice every day. She is determined to show what conjurers can do for the good, since some believe all conjurers are inherently evil. She gains two good friends and soon they are investigating what happened to Ella's favorite teacher and they're going to find him if they can. So it's about standing up for oneself and one's friends, doing what's right even when it's hard and caring about others. A full color graphic novel, Source Align is one of six summer apprentices to Professor Balthazar on the Isle of Warren. One of them will become his assistant so there is plenty of rivalry. They are there to learn about cryptids, how to care for them, and to learn about each other. Source and Line seems to have a natural talent for working with cryptids, but another student often steals her answers to get credit with the professor. Then one by one, students are being turned into glass. Who is doing this and why? Source and Line thinks she might be doing it without knowing it. This, the mystery is solved, but now Source and Line has fallen into a coma while reading a book. It ends on a cliffhanger, as you can tell, so there's more to come. <laughs> this is so much fun. It's a full-color graphic novel told with humor. Sue, Suyapa Gutierrez, 15, learns that instead of going to sleepaway camp with her friends, her family is spending the summer with relatives in the Honduras. They live in the country, so there will be no texting, no internet, no cable TV. It's going to be completely different. Once there, Sue learns that her mother has been planning a quinceanera for her after she had expressly said no, she didn't want one. Getting to know her grandmother is great. They have a lot in common, but grandma's health takes a bad turn and she passes away. In honoring her grandmother, who was also a bit of a rebel, Sue and her family find a way to make the quinceanera more palatable for Sue and still satisfy her mother. It's about family traditions and heritage, re-meeting your relatives, and standing up for yourself and what you want. Okay. Katrina, 12, doesn't really know, well, doesn't really remember the details. There was a car accident a few years ago and her memory was affected. Still, she does know that she and her parents are in the witness protection program and she must be very careful who she talks to and what she says. They live in an RV and she is homeschooled. They are always ready to move on at a moment's notice. She recently befriended their new neighbor's foster son, Parker Jimenez. They are in town together when Parker learns that Katrina's mom has been picked up by the feds and he assumes it's La Migra. Soon they are on the run together to get to the safe house in Atlanta and hope that her father is there. Katrina is about to learn that what she had been told all her life was a lie. Gordon Corman, you can always count on him to come up with a, another book and a great idea. Mason and Ty have been best friends and have always done everything together since they met in elementary school. They're in, now in seventh grade and a new girl, Ava, has moved to town. They are both smitten, so they make a vow to, that neither of them will pursue her in order to save their friendship. But one night at the Harvest Festival, a bad storm hits and Mason found himself helping Ava and they kissed. His friend saw it. That killed their friendship. In high school, Mason is driving his car and he is hit by another. When he wakes up in the hospital, he is 12 again. He is a 17-year-old in a 12-year-old body, reliving the autumn that broke their friendship. He will try anything to keep that from happening again. So it's about time travel, uh, promises and regrets, friendship, 
and trying to keep a promise. Again, a full color graphic novel. This is inspired by The Shining and it's another look at the Underlook Hotel as it's called in this book and its ghosts. Jack Axworth is a former author and the current caretaker of the hotel. He has become reclusive. Susie is a local who has been hired to tutor Jack's son, Danny. Elijah Jones, amateur filmmaker, has come to Estes Park, Colorado to film Jack Axworth and find out why he refuses any interviews, among other things. With some additional help, they investigate what is really going on at the Underlook, and they discover that Jack has plans to destroy the hotel. What can they do? Hmm. James, 12, and his younger sister, Ava, 10, and their parents have moved to a new town in Oregon. His parents tell him how much he will love it because it is perfect. All he knows is how much he misses his friends in Texas. They now live in a gated community where everyone knows everyone else. But things still seem a bit weird to James. And then he starts to get the notes. The first one appeared on his computer keyboard, though he knew no one had been in his room. It asked him if he was worthy of living in the house, and it was signed, The Keeper. James and Ava had a prank war going on, and he is sure the note is her latest attempt to scare him. But things continue to get weird, and James, while he can't quite figure it out, he's on, on alert. Then suddenly, James and Ava's lives, lives are in danger. This is creepy and spooky, but not too bad. There are plenty of suspects. James will protect his sister, and Ava will protect James, too. And I like what it says up there. Did you forget I'm watching you on the cover? Silas, 12. Wait, I'm sorry, what? Well, I said creepy. <laughs> yeah. Silas, 12, lost his mother at birth. His father has been all he ever needed. Self-educated, curious about many things, Silas's father also educates Silas after his first experience at school was a disaster. Silas has thrived under his tutelage with, a little, with very little in his world to disturb him. Now three men have taken his father and they had a pony for Silas too, but Silas stayed home. When the pony returns on its own, Silas is determined to find, take him and find his father. Silas's best and only friend is Mittenwool, a ghost. Silas can see many ghosts, but he does not interact with them but it does make his journey more difficult until it helps. Silas encounters Enoch Farmer, who is a marshal looking for the same men that took his father. This is an unusual journey and Silas is sometimes overwhelmed with what he must do. His determination to find his father keeps him moving ahead. And I've never really said that this takes place in like the very late 1800s or early 1900s in that general time frame. Reminiscent of Dog Song by, by Paulson and its stream of consciousness approach to storytelling, North Wind shares Leaf's solo canoe trip, heading north, always north, to escape the sickness that has killed so many. He learns in order to survive, and he also has a bit of good luck. So it's very um, Nordic is my take on it because of the landscape. Journal-like writing, amazing illustrations of black, red gouges on the page, mixed media collage, convey the frustration and sorrow of so much. The news loop on the TV, the main character's mom refuses to change the channel. The younger brother is lost in a video game, ignoring the world around him. The sister is preparing to attend a protest. The father is isolated in a bedroom, continuing his horrible raspy cough. Booklist says, the result is an important combination that expresses the zeitgeist of a troubled time. It is essential reading. And the Bulletin of the Center, Bulletin of the Center for Children's Book says, this powerful title may become the memory book for how we made it through troubled times. Each of them said troubled times. And as you read, you begin to understand that it's COVID times. They're all trapped home, not really going anywhere. The father's isolated in a separate bedroom. And it really gives a sense of how discombobulated everybody is and, and the art and the, the phrases are powerful. Alana Lopez, 16, is a biracial Jewish Latina, just like the author. She is sent to Prague to spend the summer with her artist aunt. Her parents hope she will get over it, 
Alana loves her violin and wants to play it for a career. And Sophia lives on Rose Hill where Alana finds a neglected Jewish cemetery. She carefully begins to free it from the overgrowth and meets Benjamin, a ghost from the cemetery. He shows her Prague from his point of view and they enjoy each other's company. But a monster from her Jewish past has met her and is planning how he will convince her to go with him. It's about gentle and caring people and that monsters can be among us unseen and then doing what you can for those you love. Full color graphic novel, Aziza was born in Ornu. Her people were conquered and now to become a full citizen, her only choice is knighthood. She hides her background and works hard making some new friends as well as rivals. As she succeeds, she begins to understand that the Bait Saji Empire may not care about her or her people or her friends. It's about finding your place and surviving, supporting others, working hard to get to your goal and recognizing deception. There could be a sequel to that, but I don't know if anything's planned right now. Kabir Nine was born in jail and has lived there his whole life with his mother. Now the new warden says he is too old to be in jail and he is released into the world with little time for orientation. He doesn't know anything about our world, just things in jail. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, he befriends a slightly older girl, Ronnie, who takes him under her wing and helps him adjust to his new life. Now they must decide how to go about their next step to find his father or his grandparents with very little to go on. Kabir is determined to do what he can to get his mother released since she was innocent of the crime. As members of a lower caste, they are often treated poorly or ignored. Kabir maintains his integrity. His mother had taught him to do what is right and not to lie. Rani stretches the truth when it helps her and Kabir, but she does not hurt others. And so they pursue their goal of finding his father or his father's people. Full color graphic novel, Liz Zen called Lizzie lives with her grandfather and she has taken some goats to town to sell by herself for the first time. While there, she steals some coins from a sacred fountain to pay for her return trip. After returning home, she is visited that night in her sleep. The well demands repayment, not in coins, but in wishes. Lizzie must find a way to provide what had been wished for, for those particular coins she took, or she will be drowned. The well servant says it is the three wishes that that are connected to the coins that are valuable and she has three days to do what she needs to. Each task is different and the last task may kill her. William Orser, um, now he's 12 and he's the first week of seventh grade. He has been called Worser since in second grade, everyone's name was on a roster with the first initial, a period, and then the last name making his W Orser. The class bully started right then calling him Worser. His life has been upended since his widowed mother suffered a bad stroke. His aunt has moved in with him and is unfailingly upbeat, still calls him Potato, a nickname from babyhood, both of which drive him crazy. His masterwork is a 300 page, 300 plus pages of lists of his observations about words. Working on his lists usually brings Worser to his peaceful place and helps negate any bad interactions at school. But soon the school library is no longer available after school and he has to search for a new place where he can go and work on his book. He finds a used bookstore and he makes a deal with the owner that he will come in, spend some time there, buy a used book, donate it back and head home, which is a pretty clever idea. He brings the lit club, President Donya, who he likes, with him to the bookstore and finds that this is a group of people he can relate to. They are going, things are going better for him until it looks like the owner might have to close the bookstore. Under too much press, pressure, Worser implodes and he does something he believes is unforgivable. So there's stress from a major life change, his mother's stroke, interacting with others can be positive and panic is not a friend. Now we have some nonfiction for teens. This is a short, small book, 40, 46 pages. It addresses observations that she has received. The title, if you can read it, is Inheritance, a visual poem. Mm -hmm. She says, and I quote, some people tell me to fix my hair and by fix, they mean straighten, they mean whiten. 
embracing, embracing heritage and personal worth, Acevedo challenges thoughtless racial remarks and enthusiastically celebrates what makes her her and knows that her children will love themselves too. This was first published in France in 2016. It's a graphic memoir. It's a look at one individual's experiences as a neurodiverse person in France. Marguerite is 27 at the beginning of the book. She has a full-time job that stresses her due to other people's behaviors and expectations. When she asked the human resources persons for some accommodations, she got the runaround. She knows she is different, but why is that an issue? Finally, she does some Google searching and lands on autism and Asperger's syndrome which it says in the book is a term that is no longer being used, but at that time it was. She went to the Center for Autism Resources to be tested and learned that she does have Asperger's. This was a relief to her as it explained her different approach to things. The art goes from mostly black, white, and gray to including more colors as she embraces who she is and what she needs. She does state that France is about 40 years behind everyone else in accepting autism in its many forms and understanding that this is a different way of thinking. It is not a disease that needs to be cured, like some people thought. A very, um, you really get a sense of her life and how she lives and what things are like for her from this book. And she is now striving to let people in France know what autism really is and, and how, how big a spectrum there really is for people who have been diagnosed. And even though she's 27, I think it's a strong book for teens to read as well. Full color graphic memoir, born in Wuhan, China at age four, Laura moves to join her parents in Texas where, where her parents are graduate students. This new place is bizarre and unsettling to her. No grandparents, no cousins, no rice patties, no water buffalo. What, it's all different. She feels out of place and struggles with being accepted. As the front cover says, Laura illustrates her coming of age as a girl who simply wants to make the basketball team, escape Chinese school, because she has to go to Chinese school in the US, and figure out why girls make her heart flutter. So this follows her from childhood to college where she identifies as queer, and after when she returns to Wuhan in September of 2019, before COVID came around us. This is a book I have not read completely. I read a number of entries. There's one two page spread per person. The left side is an illustration of the individual and the right side, side contains text about them. Occasionally the format is interrupted with a page or two of information such as settler colonialism 101 and whose land are you on? Discussing issues that are important to native peoples. The back of the book contains three pages with a paragraph each on 15 additional native people, including author Louise Erdrich. This book was published for adults, but teen readers could find the brief biographies and other information of interest that could capture them. The author is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Brendan Kiley and Jason Reynolds met while on their first book tour promoting each of their first books. It wasn't long before Brendan noticed the difference in how they each were treated by the many different people they encountered. In this book, Brendan uses examples from his own life as well as statistics and other facts to make a point on the difference between how white people treat each other and how a number of white people treat people of color. He encourages readers to treat all people with kindness and politeness for the end result of equity and equality. Told chronologically in free verse with plenty of white space, the author revisits significant events of the civil rights movement. It's very effective and the moving poems convey the hardships and efforts for equality. And it does include occasional photos from the time. From elementary school through high school with a brief stop in college and another stop as an adult, the author explores what art has meant to her and how she expresses herself with it. She asks herself questions who am I? And why do my friends see me differently than I see myself? She, as, as a young adult, she contacted the New York Times to let them know their cartoons all come from the same perspective. They replied and asked her if she could recommend anyone. She said, me, and she got the job. Whoa, go. <laughs> she was hired. Self-advocacy, contacting others with a polite criticism, 
can result in positive responses. And she has found a way to, to uh, use her art to make a living. This is a full color memoir. Kendra survived the mass shooting at Umpqua Community College in Oregon. She was on campus, but she was not shot. Still, she has physical reactions every time she hears about another mass shooting and also on the anniversary of the Umpqua shooting. The reader is there with her, feeling her panic and anxiety. And finally, she realizes that therapy could help her deal with all of that. It includes resources for suicide presented at the back of the book because she does try to take her life at one point in the story. She said she didn't plan it, it just happened. As it says inside the front cover, in this groundbreaking, exceptionally researched installment of the award-winning Scientists in the Field series, discover how lizards rapidly adapt to life in the Caribbean islands, allowing scientists to study Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection in real time, which was fascinating. Anoles are the lizards they study, and how the different species live and adapt makes fascinating reading, especially if you love lizards. This is another exceptional title in this series, and it, they do talk about how, how they're measuring the adaptions and the changes that the, the, the lizards show when they go from one island to another due to a hurricane or other things that have happened to sp spread them around to different islands. Told in poetry and prose, this biography of Octavia Estelle Butler gives a sense of her life and writings. She was an early writer of science fiction and in a, in a, in a somewhat set the course for science fiction. As Kirkus says, an inspiring look at the formative years and work of a literary giant that's sure to capture young readers' attention. Yeah, and we have some... a lot of her works, definitely. <laughs> I thought you had, perhaps. <laughs> Now we'll talk about fiction for old. Yeah. Oh, sorry, what? No, I said sci-fi is one of my things, so yeah. yeah. Fiction for older readers. Angel is whisked away from California to Brooklyn, New York, and her uncle Spence, after an incident that left her injured and now form left her injured and her now former boyfriend in trouble. In Brooklyn, she needs to heal and find her feet in a new city, a new school, and a new home situation. A special class, the first period of the day, helps her to adjust, helps her find friends and regain her equilibrium. The reader will root for her as she begins to enjoy life and find what makes her happy. It isn't until almost the end of the book that the reader finds out what happened in California. It's a hopeful, caring story about a girl really finding her way. This version of the Medusa uh, legend has a different take from the most often told versions. It is told from Medusa's point of view. She and her two sisters have gone to a deserted island in order not to encounter any other people. They are dedicated to each other. One day, a young man arrives via a small boat. He and his dog slowly explore the island. When they finally speak to each other, Medusa is hidden by a cave entrance. He is Perseus, and Medusa says her name is Marina. As Medusa tells her story to Perseus, the reader sees the myth in a different light. From her point of view, and this myth has a different ending. Interesting. Okay, first off, I have to confess, I'm an Anglophile. I love England and stories set there. So like, I read this book, you bet. <laughs> um, Britt is a high school senior. Soccer has been her focus and love. She had a soccer scholarship to UCLA, but just recently badly damaged her leg at a game. Medically, she will recover, but they found a blood clotting disorder she must live with the rest of her life. No more soccer. To happenstance, she is one of four contestants for prize money for a contest involving English literature and famous sites in England. Her writing is not strong and she must not only solve the puzzles involving the authors and sites, she must write in a journal a compelling series of tales about her experiences in England. So they all get to travel to England, uh, to London to start with and, and um, are given this, these tasks that they need to do. Early on, she meets Luke, who goes along on her journey, but he does not help with the puzzles. He only does things like how to take the train to Bath and facts about C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, because she didn't know them very well. And a bit of a romance pops up too. There's lots of fun information about England and literature. It's also about learning about oneself and learning to share some of yourself with others, facing life's challenges. 
Sunny Gill's older brother died a year ago and left him his notebook. Sunny reacted to the anniversary of his death by cutting his hair, shaving his beard, and quitting wearing his turban. He no longer looks like a sick. This night, he goes to the prom alone and someone swipes the notebook. The rest of the night is a series of madcap chasing, motorcycle riding, event busting ridiculousness. Also romantic and life changing. Sunny finds his way through this loss and on to life. So it's about grief, stepping outside one's usual routine, being open to change, and there is a lot of humor in this book as well, even though it is a sad event that they're, he's remembering. This one's a little tough. The book starts with Ellis graduating from high school. Chapters from the past are labeled by Ellis's age at, starting at age 11, and current day chapters are not labeled. Ellis is from the wrong side of the tracks. Her father is in prison off and on. Her mother lives at home with her when she feels like it and disappears for days or weeks when she doesn't. Ellis is in the same class at school as Easton Aubrey and they are from very different worlds, but they become fast friends. Ellis is taken in at age 11 and anytime she needs a home, Easton's family will provide that for her and they are well off. Something happened that resulted in Ellis being sent across the country for her last year of high school from Indiana to her aunt in California. It is alluded to, but not explained until near the end of the book. After high school graduation, Ellis has to find out if Easton is still her best friend and maybe more, or if they are done. Their relationship is complicated and quirky and at times it puzzles the reader. Each is reluctant to say what they want or what they hope for to each other. And content warning, there is language, child neglect and abandonment, sex, and an incarcerated parent. So there's a lot going on in this book, just so you know that. This is fiction, but it's inspired by her life. Um, and it's a graphic novel. A freshman at Greenville High School in Dearborn, Michigan, she that's where she had been going, had had, oh no, sorry, that's where they moved to. It does have a large Muslim population. She and her family have just moved there from a community where Huda was the only girl in school, the only person in school wearing a hijab. Now she is working on fitting in at her new school with lots of Muslim students as well. As Booklist says in their review, the specific context of Huda's story is sure to resonate with Muslim teens, but the pitch perfect jokes and search for a way to stand up for herself without standing out too much is something lots of teens can relate to. Belle, 17, is half Filipino and half white, and she has been avoiding applying to colleges she doesn't really know what field she wants to pursue. She has a knack for engineering, but not an interest in it. A teacher basically corners her into trying out for the robotics team and she unintentionally nails it. The team is all boys with one other girl who does not support Belle in being added to the team at this late time. A senior, now, really? And the boys discount her as a newbie. She will only be a hindrance because they'll have to explain everything to her all the time. Except the team captain, Mateo Luna, recognizes that she has an innate knack and he supports her being on the team. Bringing her up to speed on engineering language and the goals of the robotics team takes valuable time and some members are not in favor of that. As Bell and Teo work together along with other team members, subtle changes between them begin to happen. So it's female empowerment, engineering and robotics, looking to the future, finding your talents, and maybe a little bit of romance. Okay, whoa, this is, ooh, okay, <laughs> this is book one of two. Seven teens from seven families will soon compete in a tournament to the death. Every 20 years, the blood moon falls over Ilverneth and the tournament is imminent. A compromise from years ago, the last teen in the tournament wins for their family, access to the town secret high magic for the next 20 years. The champions will use only common magic, usually centered on a crystal in a ring, to fight the others. Many have trained for this their whole lives. One, one wants to break the curse, hoping all seven of them will survive. The general rules are the tournament lasts up to three months. If there is no winner by then, every champion still alive will die and no one will have access to the high magic for the next 20 years. The strategies of each family, secrets they harbor from each other, and which curse maker will support a family's champion takes up the first 40, 145 pages. Once the tournament begins, this is gruesome at times, but also captivating. 
Not every champion is who they appear to be. School Library says a, a strong choice for all YA collections. And there's a cliffhanger ending, of course, because it's book one of two. But wow. Compelling, but gruesome. A lot, yeah. Alice has gone from the in crowd to outcast status due to a stunt she pulled last summer. But now that her former best friend is dead, she wants to solve the mystery of who did it. Her new tutor, Iris, joins her as they are both convinced that Brooke's boyfriend, who was also Alice's former boyfriend, didn't do it. Alice got hooked on Agatha Christie mysteries and plans to use some techniques from Miss Marple to find the killer. There are some red herrings and unexpected complications included. This is a good mystery that shows that things are usually more complicated than we think. Never cut and dried. Mm -hmm. Based on the play, The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde, this title uses many of the names from the play and the concept that a child was left in a handbag at the train station, <clears throat> but otherwise it is its own story in current times. Now 18, Janie, the abandoned baby, is happy with her adoptive family and longing after her best friend, Algie's cousin, Gwen. Algie, a longtime love him and leave him type of guy, is focused on Janie's naive cousin, Cecil. An epic promposal is in the works too. Humor, longing, and happiness abound with some unexpected remarks about porn stars and underwear parties. Just mentioned. How wonderful it is <clears throat> that no bullying or name calling for either of these two queer couples, just hope and love. Crest is a merfolk and at 16, each is required to spend one month on land to help a human. If they don't, they will never be able to return to the sea. Crest thinks humans are naturally selfish and destructive, but he knows he must go. <clears throat> Once on land, after a bit of sea magic changes his fins to legs and clothes him, he must figure out how to walk and balance, if that's all different. His name is Ross while on land and he accidentally or serendipitously finds a human to help. <clears throat> Sean has just been dumped by his boyfriend and he wants him back. As they get to know each other and plot a strategy to show Dominique what he is missing, they begin to have feelings for each other. This is a queer rom-com that is sex positive and it celebrates love and understanding. <clears throat> Lolo, 14, always thought of herself as an average teen dealing with the usual family issues. Then one day, a police officer pulls a gun on her older brother who is innocent. It is mistaken identity and her temper snaps. She uses her mind to throw the officer to the side and then quickly leaves that and that night thinks about what happened. She tells her brother, it's like a switch in my brain got turned on, like there's an energy current flowing there. I forgot to say this is a, a graph, full color graphic novel. Word gets around and soon the local tough wants her to join his organization soliciting protection money. She refuses and continues to develop her, her powers, but things are going to get worse before they get better. Camilla and Danny meet as roommates at the Peachtree Hills Treatment Facility in Georgia. Danny has been using drugs and still thinks she can quit at any time. Camilla attempted suicide and is also cutting herself. That seems to help her. She managed to hide a tiny travel sized pair of tweezers in her bed and she will use it when she needs it. Both resist the program and the facility and one day they find a spot by an outbuilding and they just walk away. They end up at a party some town kids are having. Danny feels right at home at the party until she sees Camilla in the shower holding a piece of glass with blood running down her arm. Daddy calls Peachtree to get help and states that both Camilla and she need it. From here on, they both follow the program and find way, a way to have some successes. Camilla teaches dance and they hold demonstration at Parents' Day. Still, they both know this will be a lifelong effort. Prince Jones, 17, has an hour radio show every week thanks to his uncle and he gives love advice. He is usually spot on with his observations and recommendations. Danny Ford, a senior in high school, avoids love and focuses on her writing. Except since an incident of sexual assault the year before, her writing is not happening. She told no one and is trying to deal with it on her own. 
Then comes the opportunity Prince has been looking for. Danny has been the girl of his dreams for a while now. He wagers with her that he can get her to fall in love with him in three dates. She knows that can't happen, so she accepts. As Kirkus says, a sweet, charming story with both heartwarming and heartrending moments. 17th century France, Tanya de Baz is the daughter of a retired musketeer and has been practicing fencing under his coaching most of her life. She has a chronic illness causing dizziness and weakness in her limbs. It is always there, but occasionally she cannot avoid passing out. She is becoming of age, but in their small town outside Paris, no one considers her capable or marriageable. Her father is brutally murder, murdered, and his last wish was to send Tanya to a finishing school to help her become marriageable. Once there, she learns the school is actually teaching now four young women fencing and intrigue in order to help protect the young king. Tanya slowly grows in strength and confidence and camaraderie with her fellow students. The ladies hope they will be accepted by the musketeers if they are successful in thwarting the, the threat to the king. At, at each high class event, the young ladies are told which gentlemen they are to attract and carefully get information from while seeming to be silly young ladies. Tanya's situation is well described as the author also has what we now call postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POTS, and LGBTQA A plus women are also present. This is book one of a trilogy. Joan Cheng Hunt, 16, is once again spending the summer in London with her mother's family, the Hunts. She and her Chinese Malaysian father live in a small town outside London, but he's gone to travel to Malaysia to visit family while she's in London. Then she learns that her, her mother's family are monsters and her crush is a legendary hero and monster slayer who is now in their time. Soon she is running for her life and teams up with the stuck up Aaron Oliver and the Olivers hate the Hunts. Monsters steal time from humans and use it to time travel. As she grew, Joan lost the special monster ability that the Hunts have to hide things in thin air. But her gram told her she will come into a special greater power in the future. As it says on the cover, in every story there is a hero and a monster. She is not the hero. But she's just trying to, to live. She doesn't steal time from anybody. She doesn't know anything about that doesn't know anything about the monster world, but now she's thrown into the middle of it. Hmm. Kate Sanchez, 17, loves photography and is good at it. She gets, she is dedicated to perfecting her photos, but she gets a few likes on social media, but not very many. She kind of accidentally created an account that suggests, that suggests she is someone else, her coworker at the pet rescue facility where she takes photos of abandoned pets to promote their availability. She knows it's wrong, but her friend gave up all social media a couple of years ago, and so she'll never see it. And now, Kat is getting the recognition that she had craved. Kat is overweight, biracial, and discovering that she may be bisexual. She knows that she should shut down the new site, but it's so fulfilling for her. This house of cards is bound to fall. And what's the title on that one? Oh, that was... um. No filter and other lies. It did yeah. kind of get covered up too. Thank you. It's a rough with a link and putting all the stickers on like that. <laughs> this this book stayed with me for a number of days after I read it. It's really good. Asher, 17, lost his mother a year ago in a car accident. The semi driver was drunk and ran her off the road, and he did not receive the punishment Asher thinks he deserved due to a technicality. Over the course of the book, certain facts and Asher's plans are revealed to the reader. Asher has started group therapy in two different groups since he made no progress in accepting his loss. He befriends an older gentleman, Henry, along with Sloan and Will, who are close to his own age. They agree to travel with him to Memphis so he can take his long distance girlfriend to the prom, but his real plan is to kill the man who killed his mother. Believe it or not, this is an upbeat book with the final plan lurking in the distance. They all accept and bond with each other as they travel, they have fun, they laugh. But ultimately, what will Asher do? Nine short stories from a, from a college breakup and recovery to a set of imaginary characters waiting to be needed for a story, all with a little or a lot of romance. 
And uh, just so you know, one of the stories has quite a few F words in it that she doesn't usually do, but it's just in one of the, there's a couple times in other stories, but that one story had it quite a bit, kind of surprised me. But um, very good stories, of course, with Rainbow Rowell as the author. Two different Ruta Septus books here. The first is a graphic novel version of Between Shades of Grey. It's muted full color graphic novel and conveys the 2011 story well of Lena, 15, her younger brother Jonas and their mother who are arrested and sentenced to a work camp for years. They are fed little and worked very hard. The fictional account was pulled together from the experiences of the author's family members and, as the author notes at the back of the book, survivors of the deportation, historians, and government officials. This takes place in Romania, 1989. Kristen Florescu, 17, and his family are barely surviving the regime of Nicolae Sesescu. There are spies everywhere, and due to a small mistake, now Kristen is forced to spy on his neighbors and the family his mother cleans house for, an American who works for the American embassy. Everyone is suspicious of everyone else for good reason. Only Kristen's father, called Bunu, is willing to speak out loud, but he is ill. There is some comedy relief as Bunu and the others delight in jokes about Sesescu and the regime, but life is very hard. Christian finally comes up with an idea that may outsmart the spies, but it could cost him his life. The horrible conditions, little food, little warmth in winter, suspicions, beatings, despair, wild dogs are a threat. They are clearly portrayed. The revolution began on December 21st, 1989. Christian joins it. This one was a lot of fun too. Barrett can't believe her first day of college is a compendium of awkwardness, tripping, saying the wrong thing more than once, and starting a fraternity on fire. Accident? <laughs> but what is really unbelievable is when what should be the next day, September 22nd, is a repeat of her first day, September 21st, Groundhog Day style. She avoids the fraternity and improves some of her comments, but it keeps happening. On her third first day of college, she discovers a classmate is also repeating the day. Maybe together they can discover what is going on and how to get to tomorrow. There's a little bit of romance in here and um, really learning to take on responsibility before things change and they begin to move ahead in the future again. Gigi Wong is a high school junior and she is driven to be the best at everything at Suburbia, a high-end prep school. But there is a lot of competition. She loves coding and has been working on a matchmaking program to help with her great Aunt Rosa's business. She, she is likely to be the next extraordinary matchmaker of the family. She decides to copy and alter the program she's been creating to make an entry for an app writing contest that's been announced at school. This app will put people with similar answers to a series of questions into the same chat room, the goal being finding a new friend. She chose this hoping it will help her new friend and a new to the school Etta find more friends. It starts out great, but then it becomes a scandal. Her oldest and best friend Kyle is mad at her. Etta won't speak to her. How did this happen? This is my whole list, but I do have three, three titles in series just to mention. Um, Enemies is uh, book four in the Barry Brook Middle School graphic novel series. You might be interested in that if you have those in your collection. This is um, the book three in the Friends graphic memoir series by Shannon Hale. This one's set in um, 1987 when she was in eighth grade. And remarkably, Ruby is Emmy and Friends series book six. Ruby is another side character in previous stories in this series, and this in this one she takes the front setting. So again, thank you again. Those are all the the books I have to talk about today, and I didn't go over all that much. It's amazing. Oh, wow. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure there's not any other ones? <laughs> there's some others I wanted to read, but didn't get it done. Yeah, yeah. No, if I didn't sleep, like I've said before, I could get more reading done. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. No, no. So I like sleep. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, leave your slides up there for just a minute. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments or thoughts or um, 
um, recommendations of other books that you might want, you all might want to share. Um, as Sally well, said, she does not um, always read everything. She can't read everything. There's no way anyone could read everything. But um, well, she's always looking for new titles to add or to, to read about. Um, and we do have a thank you from Gail says, um, you've just increased my reading list. <laughs> <laughs> and I've done. Uh, <laughs> glad, I think that's a good thing, Gail. And then another thank you, these are great titles. I agree. I always find good titles here. And I like when, sometimes we've done them before the holiday season um, and sometimes they fall into January, but I always use these as, um, I know the, the purpose of this is for libraries to find titles potentially for their um, collections. Um, but I use them as a cheat sheet for buying gifts for my nieces and nephews. Oh. I have from I have those in a range from a year old to, oh gosh, how old is the oldest now? 13? Something crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and so That's it's always a good, range. good ideas. I'm always taking my own notes. If you saw me typing things, you're doing things. Yes. <laughs> um, and we do have, um, Amy said, she, Amy added quite a few titles to her to be, to be a TBR list, to be read list too. Thank you. Good. Oh, great, great. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I think I will then. I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen here. There we go. That should do it. All right. Yes. Um, um oh oh we do have one question that just popped up um invisible differences uh did you say that that was a graphic memoir yes yes it is so it's a graphic novel novel of her of her remembering how she what she went through as she discovered that she had asperger's mm -hmm. <clears throat> So yes. it's actually the author's experience. It's not just fiction. Yeah. Yes. Right. I know memoirs are tricky because you don't remember exactly what you said at any one point in time in your life, but oh, yeah. this yeah. was her experience of how other people thought of her and how they kept telling her, oh, get over it. You, you come and have fun and things like that, which wasn't going to be fun for her because of who she was. And they weren't accepting that. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Thank you. All right. So that will uh, wrap it up for today's show. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here with us today. Thank you, Sally. Uh, I'm going to pop over to our Encompass Live main um, web page here. If you use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, we are the only thing called that on the internet uh, at the moment, so nobody is allowed to use that. <laughs> Uh, same name, um, but that will bring you to our main page here. We have our upcoming shows listed. And um, I said I would show you here's where our archives are. There's a link here at the uh, under at the bottom of the list to our archive shows. The most recent one at the top of the list here. Today's show will be up here. Should be done by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's ready to watch. Um, Uh, we do have a link, uh, information up here because somebody asked about this earlier, so I'm going to mention it. Um, if you watch an archive show and you want to earn continuing education credits, if you're in a Nebraska library, we have a, a form online for all of those kind of things. Um, if you are in a Nebraska library and you attended today's show live, we automatically submit those CE credits to today's show for you. Um, if you're not in a Nebraska library, uh, you need to go to your own um, CE whoever handles your continuing education credits. Um, if in about an hour or so, you'll get an email automatically generated from the GoToWebinar system saying, thank you for attending today's show. This is, serves as your proof of attending the live session. So you can use that to bring to your, um, uh, whoever does that for you. And um, we'll have a, C, a PDF certificate attached to that as well. Um, that's just for our live sessions. For our recordings, we have no way of knowing who watches those. So you will have to deal with your um, CE people on how you will get earned CE credits for these recordings. Um, if you're in Nebraska, we do have a, a form for that. Um, while I'm here, I'll show you there is the Best New Children's Books session here that Sally previously did. So if you want to watch that recording or get her handout or look at the slides for that one, you can find that right there. And the summer reading program one that was done in December, same thing, all the information is there um, for Sally's previous sessions. 
Um, I'll mention here too, there's a search feature. You can search our archives for any topic you might be interested in. Um, see if we're going to show on it. You can search the full show archives or just the most recent 12 months. That is because this is our full show archive going back to when Encompass Live premiered, and I'm not going to scroll all the way down at this huge list. Um, we premiered in January 2009. So we are now this year in our 15th year of Encompass Live. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. Uh, so, but we have all of our show our, um, recordings here, uh, going back to the very beginning and all hosted on YouTube. So some of the information, so just pay attention when you're watching an old show to the original broadcast date. Um, some of the information will be great and still stand the test of time and be useful, uh, but some things will become old and outdated and you may, um, you know, just take that into consideration. Um, resources may no longer exist. They may have changed drastically. Links may be broken. Uh, people may no longer work at the library that they were at 10, 15 years ago and presenting for it. So just keep an eye on that date if you do watch any of our recordings. We do also, pro uh, I said we'd send an email to everyone. We also have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. I've got it open over here. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like there. We do remind you of things. Um, here's a reminder to log into today's show. We do a little music speaker thing. When recordings are available, we post about that as well. So um, you can follow our Facebook page for that. Um, and also um, the Encump Live hashtag, we use that and we push things out to Twitter and Instagram as well. Um, all right, so that'll wrap it up for today's, uh, other for today's show. I'll be doing this next week. Um, oh, there's one other thing I want to mention. You may have seen that here as I went to the Encompass Live page. Um, another session thing we do here, we do this weekly online show, but we do an annual conference called Big Talk from Small Libraries. And I just yesterday um, finalized and announced the full schedule for it. This is a um, online conference done on always the last Friday in February. Uh, it is all of the presenters from libraries with an FTE or population served of 10,000 or less. Uh, this is sponsored by us at the Library Commission and the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. Uh, it's a national conference. Anyone is invited to attend online all day on February 24th this year, and the full schedule is up. So please do take a look at the schedule and register if you haven't yet to join us that day. The entire day will also be recorded um, if you are unable to um, attend then. And we do have, you see here, a previous conferences link here where you can you'll, you'll post the recordings after the conference. All right, so um, that's it for today. I hope you join us next week when our topic is First Amendment audits, what you need to know. Um, this is something that many libraries are encountering lately in the last few years. And uh, we have uh, three library directors from here in Nebraska who are going to talk about their experiences and how you can um, deal with that in your library. So please do sign up for that show and any of our other upcoming shows. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Good to see you, Sally. And we'll see you all hopefully on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye.